Imagine calling yourself the most corrupt cop in your jurisdiction as you go around abusing your power and making illegal cash. Robert Smith was one of many corrupt police officers who thought they were above the law. But what happens when a cop meets the wrong person? How do they react when they meet someone who wouldn't simply back down and give in to their demands? Well, Joseph Miedzianowski faced life imprisonment, but Apolito and Caracapa lost their lives in prison. That's not all. Join us as we check out stories about corrupt officers who got what they deserve. Louis Apolito and Stephen Caracapa. Our first story takes us to the heart of New York City, where power and crime often dance a dangerous tango. Louis Apolito, a decorated NYPD detective, was a man of respect and authority. But beneath the shiny badge and commendations, he lived a double life. Apolito and his partner Stephen Caracapa had a secret alliance with the Lucchese crime family, one of the infamous five families that dominated organized crime in New York. For years, Apolito and Caracapa moonlighted as hitmen for the mob, using their police credentials to access confidential information information, which they sold for hefty sums. They thought they were invincible, shielded by their badges and the Mafia's power, but they underestimated the resilience of their targets and the law's long reach. Their downfall began when they targeted a mobster who was well-connected and under federal surveillance. The mobster, suspicious of the detective's intentions, turned informant and provided the FBI with crucial information. This betrayal from within the Mafia's ranks led to a domino effect of evidence gathering, eventually crashing down the corrupt duo's empire. In in 2005, a federal grand jury in the Eastern District of New York indicted Louis Epolito and Stephen Caracapa on multiple charges, including racketeering conspiracy related to their involvement in organized crime activities spanning two decades. The indictment alleged a pattern of criminal behavior, including murder, kidnapping, witness tampering, obstruction of justice, money laundering, and drug trafficking, committed in collaboration with members and associates of the Mafia. Following their conviction in 2006, both men received life sentences sentences in 2009. Apolito and Caracapa ultimately died in prison in the late 2010s. Joseph Miedzianowski Joseph Miedzianowski was a Chicago police officer and kingpin of a drug trafficking operation that spanned across the city. Miedzianowski's criminal enterprise was lucrative and well-protected, or so he thought. Despite receiving 59 citations for valor and arrest during his 22-year career, he was secretly engaged in criminal activities, including leaking the identities of undercover officers, extorting protection money, distributing crack cocaine, supplying gang members with ammunition, and framing innocent people for crimes. Miedzianowski he exploited gang members and drug dealers, believing they had no power to retaliate. But he made a critical mistake when he tried to shake down a drug dealer who had secret ties to federal law enforcement. This dealer was a confidential informant, and Mitsianovsky's attempt at extortion gave the federal agents the leverage they needed. Armed with inside information, the authorities launched an undercover operation that eventually toppled Mitsianovsky's empire. Wiretaps, surveillance, and the testimony of turned informants painted a damning picture of the corrupt officer's activities. In 2001, one, Miedzianowski was arrested and charged with drug conspiracy and racketeering. The trial exposed his double life, shocking the public and his fellow officers. Miedzianowski was found guilty and received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. His conviction led to the dismantling of the department's anti-gang crimes unit. In 2020, Miedzianowski sought a sentence reduction under the First Step Act, but was denied. In 2022, two brothers who Miedzianowski had allegedly framed, Juan and Rosendo Hernandez, had their murder convictions overturned and were granted a retrial. Their lawyer cited claims that another detective, Rinaldo Guevara, had framed them at Miedzianowski's request. David Mack the city of Los Angeles, known for its glitz and glamour, also has a history marred by police corruption. One of the most notorious cases involved LAPD officer David Mack. Mack, a recipient of the LAPD Medal of Honor, was a respected figure within the force. However, his commendable public image was a cover for his illicit activities, which included ties to the notorious Blood Street Gang. Mack's fall from grace came when he orchestrated a bank robbery in 1997. The heist of the Bank of America yielded a staggering $722,000. But Mac's involvement was soon uncovered due to a series of mistakes and his extravagant spending following the robbery. His actions against the financial institution, which was seen as a pillar of the community, sparked outrage and led to an intense investigation. The investigation revealed Mac's connections to the Bloods gang and also raised suspicions about his possible involvement in the unsolved murder of a prominent rapper, Notorious Big, adding to the public outcry. The investigation was done by a former LAPD police officer, Russell Poole. Poole 
alleged that Mack had ties to Death Row Records and its CEO, Suge Knight, and that he had helped orchestrate the murder. Despite the allegations, Mack has never been officially charged or convicted in connection with Biggie's murder. The case remains unsolved, and many conspiracy theories surround the circumstances of Biggie's death. However, he was eventually arrested and charged with bank robbery and conspiracy in 1997. He was convicted and sentenced to 14 years in prison in 1999. Ronald Watts the story of Ronald Watts, a former Chicago police sergeant, is a chilling reminder of the devastation that corrupt law enforcement can wreak on a community. Watts operated with impunity on the south side of Chicago, where he and his team were known for their ruthless tactics. For nearly a decade, they ran a criminal enterprise that planted drugs and fabricated charges to extort money from residents and drug dealers alike. During his time as an officer, he framed and charged dozens of people with crimes they didn't commit, leading to over 200 wrongful drug crime convictions. Many of these individuals were sentenced to prison terms ranging from a few years to life. Watts and his team, known as the Watts Crew, operated in the Ida B. Wells housing project on Chicago's South Side for years. They operated with impunity, targeting drug couriers and exploiting the South Side's drug trade for their own gain. Watts's misconduct was exposed in 2006 when he was arrested by the FBI and charged with extortion and theft. He was subsequently convicted and sentenced to 22 months in prison. In 2018, the Cook County State's Attorney's Office began a comprehensive review of cases involving Watts and his team, exonerating 15 wrongfully convicted individuals. The investigation identified over 100 potentially tainted cases, and more exonerations are expected. The Ronald Watts scandal is considered one of the most significant cases of police corruption in Chicago's history, highlighting systemic failures and racial bias within the criminal justice system. Robert Jasevius the narrative now shifts to the vibrant city of New Orleans, where, in the chaotic aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, a group of police officers saw an opportunity in disaster. Among them was Robert Jasevius, alongside fellow officers Kenneth Bowen and Anthony Villabasso. These men were part of a unit that opened fire on the Danziger Bridge on September 4, 2005, claiming the lives of two civilians and wounding four others. The officers claimed they were responding to a call about police officers under fire, but evidence revealed that they had actually arrived at the scene in a budget rental truck and opened fire without provocation. The community, already reeling from the hurricane's devastation, refused to accept this explanation. A well-informed victim who survived the shooting challenged the officer's account, and their resistance sparked a broader inquiry. The vigilant community's outcry and the survivor's testimonies attracted federal attention, leading to a comprehensive investigation by the Department of Justice. The probe uncovered a conspiracy among the officers to cover up the true nature of the incident on the bridge. In 2011, Jasavius Bowen and Villavaso were among the officers charged with civil rights violations, obstruction of justice, and conspiracy. The trial revealed a cover-up by the NOPD, including planted evidence, false testimony, and a fabricated story to justify the shootings. In 2012, Jasevius, Bowen, and Villavaso were convicted of various charges related to the shootings and cover-up. Jasevius was sentenced to 40 years, Bowen to 40 years, and Villavaso to 38 years in prison. Rafael Perez the story of Rafael Perez, an officer from the Los Angeles Police Department's Rampart Division, reflects the consequences of police corruption. Perez was deeply involved in a web of misconduct that included stealing drugs from evidence lockers, framing suspects, and covering up police shootings. His actions contributed to one of the most widespread corruption scandals in the history of American law enforcement. Perez's misdeeds began to unravel when he was caught stealing cocaine from an evidence room. Facing severe charges, he sought to intimidate a fellow officer who had knowledge of his illicit activities. Activities. However, Perez underestimated the resolve and awareness of his intended target. This officer, well-versed in their rights and the law, refused to be cowed by Perez's threats and, instead, became a whistleblower, bringing crucial information to the authorities. The information provided by the courageous officer triggered an internal investigation that exposed the extent of Perez's corruption. In 1999, Perez was arrested and charged with multiple counts of misconduct. His trial shed light on the rampant corruption within the Rampart Division, overturning numerous wrongful convictions and implementing significant reforms within the LAPD. He was sentenced to five years in prison and became a cooperating witness for the government, revealing details of the corruption and implicating other officers. The scandal led to the conviction of over 20 officers, the resignation of the LAPD chief, and the payment of millions of dollars in damages to victims of police misconduct. Perez's involvement and cooperation were instrumental in uncovering the scope of the corruption, which included planting evidence, framing innocent people, stealing drugs and money, excessive force and brutality, and cover-ups and obstruction of justice. Robert Smith 
Robert Smith, popularly known as the most corrupt cop, was a master of wrongdoing. He was involved in a range of criminal activities that undermined the integrity of the police department and eroded public trust in law enforcement. His crimes included accepting bribes in exchange for official favors, such as fixing traffic tickets and providing sensitive information, as well as attempting to transport heroin, a dangerous and illegal drug. Smith's actions were part of a larger conspiracy involving other corrupt officers, including Heather Bush and Robert Hassett. Ultimately, their crimes were uncovered. Robert Smith was sentenced to 97 months in prison. He pleaded guilty in 2021 to using interstate facilities to commit bribery and attempting to transport heroin. Between 2016 and 2017, Smith, Hassett, and Bush engaged in a corrupt scheme, accepting thousands of dollars in bribes in exchange for illegally referring business to a towing company. This was in direct violation of the NYPD's Directed Accident Response Program. After Hassett's retirement, the scheme was put on hold until March 2020 when Smith revived it, recruiting Heather Bush to replace Hassett and continue the illicit activity. Prior to his conviction, he had retired from the NYPD in March 2020. Two other former NYPD officers from Long Island, Heather Bush and Robert Hassett, also pleaded guilty to bribery. Charges in the same scheme, Bush was sentenced to six months in prison, while Hassett awaited sentencing at the time his fellow officers were sentenced. All three had worked at the 105th Precinct in Queens, Len Davis. In the heart of the Big Easy New Orleans, a community was shaken by the actions of Len Davis, a police officer whose abuse of power and corrupt dealings would lead to a grave miscarriage of justice. Davis, a man sworn to uphold the law, instead operated as the head of a drug protection racket, exploiting his badge to shield drug dealers in exchange for bribes. He was also known for covering up violent crimes in the Desire Development public housing complex. Davis's exploitation of his position came to an abrupt halt when he ordered the murder of a local woman, Kim Groves. The the victim was a single mother who had previously filed a complaint against Davis for police brutality. Davis didn't know the FBI was already conducting an undercover operation in the area, and Groves' murder added urgency to their investigation. The community, outraged by the killing and Davis's broader pattern of corruption, rallied together. Local organizations alongside federal authorities worked to bring Davis to justice. Their collective action and the evidence gathered by the FBI led to Davis's arrest and subsequent conviction on numerous charges including conspiracy to commit murder. In 1996, Davis was sentenced to death. In 2005, a resentencing trial was scheduled to determine Davis's fate once again. Len Davis, representing himself in court, presented his opening argument and cross-examined witnesses, despite strong evidence against him, including recorded phone conversations with the hitman before and after the murder. Davis maintained his innocence and claimed that the witnesses testifying against him were untruthful. He argued that the evidence would ultimately raise reasonable doubt. However, However, the jury was unconvinced and recommended the death penalty on August 9th. A judge upheld this recommendation two months later. John Burge John Burge was a former detective and commander in the Chicago Police Department. He was the ringleader of a notorious group of officers known as the Midnight Crew. This squad was infamous for their ruthless interrogation tactics, which included electric shock, suffocation with plastic typewriter covers, and mock executions. They did whatever it took to extract confessions at any cost. The result was multiple false confessions, wrongful convictions, and shattered lives. The case of Andrew Wilson would become a pivotal moment in the unmasking of Burge's corruption. Wilson, accused of killing two police officers, was subjected to severe torture under Burge's supervision. In 1989, Andrew Wilson filed a civil lawsuit against four detectives, including John Burge. He alleged that he had been subjected to physical abuse, including beatings, suffocation, burning, and electric shock during police interrogations in 1982. Wilson also claimed that there was a subsequent cover-up by the police and city officials. The civil trial began on February 15, 1989, with a jury consisting of two women and four men from diverse ethnic backgrounds. When John Burge testified on March 13, 1989, he denied any involvement in or knowledge of the alleged abuse of Andrew Wilson during questioning. In 2010, after years of legal battles and the relentless efforts of victims and activists, John Burge was finally convicted, not for torture due to the statute of limitations, but for perjury and obstruction of justice related to the torture allegations. He was sentenced to four and a half years in federal prison, a sentence many felt was a mere slap on the wrist, considering the gravity and extent of his crimes. Ronaldo Guevara 
The city of Chicago is no stranger to tales of police misconduct, and the story of Ronaldo Guevara is one of the most shocking. Guevara, a former detective with the Chicago Police Department, left behind a trail of allegations involving the abuse of citizens and the violation of their trust. His career, spanning over three decades, was marred by accusations of framing innocent people, coercing confessions, and manipulating evidence. Guevara's methods were ruthless, and his targets were often vulnerable members of the community, many of whom were Latino. He prayed on the fears of immigrants and those with limited English proficiency, exploiting their situations to close cases by any means necessary. Guevara had fabricated evidence or otherwise manipulated the system to secure their imprisonment, leading to false convictions. The case of Roberto Almodovar is a prime example of Guevara's corrupt practices. Almodovar, convicted of a double homicide in the 1990s, spent 23 years behind bars for a crime he did not commit. It was later revealed that Guevara had played a pivotal role in the conviction by allegedly coercing witnesses and suppressing evidence. The fight for justice was long and arduous, but eventually, the truth began to unravel the web of Guevara's deceit. In 2017, Almodovar was released from prison, his conviction thrown out after a review of Guevara's misconduct. This was not an isolated incident. Several other convictions linked to Guevara have since been overturned. Despite the overwhelming evidence of his misconduct, Guevara has not been criminally charged, and he retired from the force with his pension intact. His legacy, however, is one of shattered lives and a community's trust betrayed. Antoinette Frank the case of Antoinette Frank, a former New Orleans Police Department officer, stands as one of the most shocking betrayals of the badge in American history. On March 4, 1995, Frank, along with an accomplice, committed an armed robbery at a restaurant that ended in a bloodbath, leaving a trail of devastation in its wake. Frank was not just any officer, she was a cop on the edge, with a history of erratic behavior and disciplinary issues that somehow slipped through the cracks of the NOPD's screening process. On that fateful night, she returned to the restaurant where she had previously worked as a security guard off-duty. With cold calculation, she and her accomplice, Rogers Lacaz, executed a robbery that spiraled into a murderous rampage. The restaurant, owned by a Vietnamese-American family, was a local favorite, and the violence of that night sent ripples of horror through the community. When the chaos subsided, two members of the family, including a brother who was also an NOPD officer and an employee, lay dead. Frank's attempt to cover her tracks by responding to the scene as an officer only added to the atrocity of her actions. The investigation that followed quickly unraveled Frank's involvement. Her motive, a desperate attempt to alleviate personal financial troubles, provided little solace to a city reeling from the betrayal. Frank was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death, becoming the first and only woman on Louisiana's death row. Eric de Valconaire the streets of Kansas City, Missouri, became the backdrop for a tragic incident that would once again highlight the issue of police accountability. On a cold day in November 2019, Cameron Lamb, a 30-year-old black man, was fatally shot in his own backyard by Eric de Valconaire, a white police officer. This case would not only stir the ongoing national conversation about race and policing, but also lead to a rare conviction of an officer for actions taken in the line of duty. De Valconaire, who was off-duty at the time, and his partner responded to a call about a traffic incident involving Lamb. They entered Lamb's property without a warrant, claiming they believed he was armed and dangerous. Moments later, de Valconaire fired the shots that ended Lamb's life, alleging that Lamb had pointed a gun at him, a claim that was later disputed during the investigation. The subsequent inquiry into the shooting revealed a series of missteps and questionable decisions by de Valconaire. In a groundbreaking verdict in 2021, he was convicted of second-degree involuntary manslaughter and armed criminal action. The court found that de Valconaire had no legal right to confront front lamb in the manner he did, and that his use of deadly force was not justified. The conviction marked a significant moment, as police officers are seldom charged and even less frequently convicted for shootings that occur while on duty. The case against de Valconaire sent a clear message that the badge does not grant immunity, and that the law must apply equally to all, including those sworn to enforce it. For the family of Cameron Lamb, the conviction of Eric de Valconaire offered a measure of justice, though it could not fill the void left by Lamb's untimely death. Wayne Jenkins. The city of Baltimore was rocked by a scandal that exposed deep-seated corruption within the ranks of its police force, particularly within the elite Gun Trace Task Force. At the center of this scandal was Sergeant Wayne Jenkins, the ringleader of a group of officers who turned their badges into licenses for criminal activity. Their transgressions were not limited to the streets. They infiltrated the very core of the department, shaking public trust in its foundation. Jenkins and his cohorts operated with brazen impunity, robbing citizens, filing for hundreds of hours of overtime they never 
never worked, stealing drugs, and even selling illegal firearms back onto the streets they were supposed to protect. Their actions were a betrayal of the oath they took as officers and a direct assault on the community's safety and well-being. The task force's corruption was eventually uncovered, leading to a federal investigation revealing their criminal enterprise's extent. In 2018, Jenkins was sentenced to 25 years in federal prison after pleading guilty to a slew of charges, including racketeering, robbery, and falsification of records. The fallout from the Gun Trace Task Force scandal was immense. The convictions of Jenkins and other officers involved led to the review and overturning of numerous cases they had touched, with the potential for more wrongful convictions yet to be uncovered. Michael Dotro. In the quiet town of Edison, New Jersey, a rogue cop named Michael Dotro took the law into his own hands, not to uphold it, but to seek vengeance against those he perceived as enemies. Dotro's story is one of malice and retaliation, a stark departure from the ideals of service and protection associated with law enforcement. Dotro's tenure with the Edison Police Department was marked by a series of vindictive acts aimed at colleagues and superiors who dared to cross him. His methods were insidious and dangerous. He even went as far as arson. In May 2013, Dotro set fire to the home of a fellow officer, a captain in the department who had reprimanded him. The captain and his family were asleep inside at the time, narrowly escaping the blaze that engulfed their home. The investigation into the arson attack unraveled the extent of Dotro's vendetta. He was found to have orchestrated not just the fire, but also a campaign of intimidation and harassment against others in the department. His actions were fueled by deep-seated animosity and a desire to punish those who stood in his way. In 2017, Dotro faced the consequences of his actions. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison after pleading guilty to attempted murder and arson. The severity of the sentence reflected the gravity of his crimes and the betrayal of his oath as a police officer. Derek Stafford the small town of Marksville, Louisiana became the scene of a heart-wrenching tragedy that shook the community to its core. Derek Stafford, a former deputy marshal, was at the center of this calamity. Stafford's actions on the night of November 3, 2015, would lead to a devastating loss and a community's outcry for justice. On that fateful evening, Stafford and another deputy were involved in a car chase that ended in gunfire. The target of their pursuit was a vehicle driven by Chris Few, who had his six-year-old son, Jeremy Martis, in the passenger seat. In a matter of seconds, a routine pursuit escalated into a hail of bullets, with Stafford and his colleague firing recklessly into Few's car. When the shooting stopped, Few was seriously wounded, and his young son Jeremy lay dead, the youngest, victim of a police shooting in the United States at the time. The incident was met with national outrage, and the subsequent investigation revealed a harrowing lack of justification for the use of deadly force. Stafford's defense, claiming he did not know a child was in the car and that he was acting in self-defense, crumbled under scrutiny. Body cam Camera footage contradicted his account, showing few with his hands raised in surrender when the officers opened fire. In March 2017, a jury found Stafford guilty of manslaughter and attempted manslaughter. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison, a stark consequence for the irreparable harm he caused. The case of Derek Stafford is a somber reminder of the immense responsibility that comes with the power to use lethal force and the tragic consequences when that power is misused. Charles Becker the tale of Charles Becker transports us back to the early 20th century, to the bustling streets of New York City, where corruption was the order of the day. Becker, a lieutenant with the New York City Police Department between the 1890s and 1910s, found himself in a scandal that would become one of the most infamous cases of police corruption in American history. Becker's story was full of all types of corrupt behavior, including illegal gambling and organized crime that thrived in New York during that era. He was known to have deep connections with various criminal elements, including the notorious gangster Jack Legs Diamond. Becker's fall from grace began with the murder of Herman Rosenthal, a bookmaker who threatened to expose the police corruption that allowed his gambling operations to flourish. One night in July 1912, Rosenthal was gunned down in cold blood near Times Square, just moments after leaving a hotel where he had been seeking protection from the very police force that Becker represented. The subsequent investigation revealed that Becker had ordered the hit on Rosenthal, fearing that his testimony would implicate him in the rampant corruption. The trial that followed was a sensation, capturing the entire nation's attention. Becker was convicted of first-degree murder, a landmark verdict that marked the first time in American history that a police officer was sentenced to death for murder. In 1916, Becker was executed in the electric chair, his legacy forever marred by the heinous crime he orchestrated. Watch the next video for more interesting content.